critical patient, there are higher chances of intraoperative pulmonary dysfunctions, higher postoperative pulmonary complications, chances of perioperative hypoxia, which increases the ICU stay as well as hospital stays, and it increases the morbidity and mortality of the patient. And 30 days mortality among those who develop post-operative pulmonary complications is 20%. That is very significantly high. So, and very interesting fact, those patients who develop post-operative pulmonary complications, 50% of the pulmonary complications are just because of anesthesia management and surgical technique. So that's the reason. A way back, 2013, Peter Slinger, who is known as the father of uh, perioperative ventilation, had made a statement, don't make things worse with your ventilator setting. How you manage the lung intraoperatively affects the postoperative outcome. It means that there is something going wrong into the lung during anesthesia during intraoperative period, during perioperative period. Let's start with the pre-oxygenation. What happens with the pre-oxygenation? We'll discuss one by what happens with the pre-oxygenation, what happens with the intraoperative actual ventilation, what happens at extubation. We'll start with the pre-oxygenation. When you pre-oxygenate pre patient, what's happening inside lung? That has been very well explained by these 2009 publications. Look at my cursors. What they did in this study, they took a chest scan in awake state, after induction, 5 minutes after induction, and 20 minutes after induction. And if you look at the scan here, area here in awake state, there is no density at all. But if you look at immediately after induction, there is development of density, which persists even after 5 minutes, and even after 20 minutes, it persists throughout the anesthesia time. And this represents atelectasis. So, all the patients under general anesthesia develop atelectasis that is for sure. An amount of atelectasis is ranging from 4% to 21% of the total lung volume, so which is significantly high. And the amount of development of atelectasis is highly dependent on how long you reoxidate with higher FiO2. And this is very interesting publications in three sets of three group of patients. First group was delivered 100% FIO2, second group was delivered 80% FIO2, and third group was delivered 60% FIO2 during pre-oxygenation. And what they did, they took a scan after pre-oxygenation at 4 minute interval, 7 minute interval, and 14 minute interval. And if, if you look at the result, so this line, vertical line is showing the amount of actual is in form of centimeter square. And this line, horizontal line, is showing a duration of pre-oxygenation. And with the 60%, those who have been given 60% FIO2 for pre-oxygenation, the amount of atelectasis was less than 2 cm square, means less than this size. But if you look at the, those who have been given 80% FIO2, the atelectasis amount at the end of 40 minutes is 4 cm square. If you look at a 4 cm square, it's like, like a mouse. This much of concentrated atelectatic patch will be there in the patient. And those who have been given 100% oxygen at the end of 14 minutes, look at the cm square of atelectasis, 14 cm square. If you look at this mobile, it's almost 12 cm. So the square of this mobile, this will be atelectatic area. So, the amount of atelectasis is depend on how long and how high FIO2 you use. And we have taken the video in goat lung cadaver. Look at this red, dark red color representing the atelectatic area. So, what are the reasons of atelectasis in a perioperative period? There are three main reasons. One, absorption atelectasis. Second, compression atelectasis. And third, surfactant atelectasis. We'll discuss it one by one. What is absorption atelectasis? As we pre-oxygenate the patient with the 100% oxygen, so this, suppose this is an alveolar fully filled with 100% oxygen. So, 
there is a partial pressure gradient between the alveoli and blood for oxygenation. Because of this partial pressure gradient, oxygen passively diffuses into the underlying blood vessel, which creates negative intrathoracic pressure, negative atmospheric pressure into the alveoli. And because of this negative pressure, sub-atmospheric pressure into the alveoli, the wall can apoges. And eventually, oxygen again trapped inside the alveoli. And again, there is a partial pressure gradient, which again lead to passive diffusion of oxygen molecule into the blood vessel. And eventually, this alveoli get collapse. This is called absorption atelectasis because of absorption of the oxygen into the blood vessel. Second is compression atelectasis. So this, is, this is a schematic representation of patient lying supine. This is head end, and this one is leg end, and this one is diaphragm. And during spontaneous breathing, the diaphragm moves equally in cephalic and caudal directions, which leads to even distribution of ventilation throughout the lung surfaces. So in a spontaneously breathing person, because of diaphragm moves, moves equally cephalic caudally and even distribution of ventilation. Ventilation is equal all around the lung, but perfusion is Perfusion is higher on this dependent part and perfusion is lower in this area. But ventilation is equal. But when you deliver anesthesia, when you give relaxation, the diaphragm loses its tone and abdominal content pushes the diaphragm cephalic. The area, lung area, which is dependent here, get compressed by the abdominal content and diaphragm cephalic moments leads to atelectatic area, development of atelectasis in this region. This is called compression atelectasis. Now what happens? Once you deliver positive pressure ventilators, this area, dependent area, compress area, get resisted for the ventilator. So when this area, so ventilation is less here and perfusion is more here. And ventilation is high on the upper part and perfusion is less, again lead to ventilation, perfusion, mismatch, shunting of blood. And coming to the third part of what is the other reason, that is surfactant atelectasis. In mechanically ventilated patient, there is reduced production of surfactant and impaired function of surfactant lead to surfactant atelectasis. So in short, under general anesthesia, there is atelectasis, stunting of blood, and over and above, there is a suboptimal ventilation causes compromise, yes, excess, compromise oxygenation. And that's the reason, minimum FiO2, we should keep, that is, healthy. So our aim, during perioperative ventilation, first thing, we need to prevent atelectasis formation. Second, we need to we need to take a measure to open atelectasis. So we'll discuss it one by one. How to prevent atelectasis formation? That can be done by three ways: by head up position, application of CPAP, and reoxygenation with the NIV. So if you induce until and unless content indicated, induce a patient, reoxygenate a patient in head up positions with improved with improved FRC, which end up in higher oxygen alveolar tension. And application of 5 to 10 CPM during pre oxygenation prevents atelectasis formation. Just keep in mind, prevention of atelectasis can be easily done by low pressure, like 5 to 10. But when you want to open the atelectatic one, it happens, it requires high pressure to open atelectatic area. Now, question is that how to deliver CPM during pre oxygenation? However, during considering pandemic of COVID-19, we should avoid use CPAP during perioperative period. Try to avoid CPAP during perioperative period. But rest of the time, you can use CPAP during pre-oxygenation. How to deliver CPAP during pre-oxygenation? If your machine is having CPAP mode, you can directly deliver CPAP through that uh, mode. If your machine don't have CPAP mode, and if you're using closed circuit, keep the APR all closed at 10, Increase the uh, flow of oxygen to 15 liter and optimal mass fitting 
will deliver pi to 10 shift graph. And look at the uh, pressure, bar graph or pressure graph. It will reach from 5 to 10 once you do it close the APL wallet. Another way, those who are using main circuit, they can also deliver a CPM by partially closing the APL wall of the main circuit, increase the flow to 15 liter, and optimal mass feeding will deliver CPM. But it's a crude method of delivering a CPM because you don't have control over the change of pressure or rise of the pressure. So this is another interesting uh, publications where first group of patient were not given CPM and second group of patients were given 10 CPM and again they took a scan. Those who were given CPM, there is no development of fatal lactation. Look at my cursor. And those patients who were not given CPM, they developed dense area in the lung. This represents fatal lactation. Again, non-energy ventilation is an effective method to prevent fatal lactation formation. But considering COVID pandemic, in a suspected COVID patient, suspect asymptomatic carrier, you should not use NIV because it is highly aerosol generating procedure. Again, HMSE is having role to prevent atelectasis formation as is having ability to deliver 70 liter humidified heated, heated oxygen with the closed mouth. It can generate 4 to 7 centimeter of H2C pair which prevents the atelectasis. But again, considering part pandemic, asymptomatic, the asymptomatic patient carrier or with the COVID positive, you should not use HFNC. So first measure of the session, CPF should be applied during pre-oxygenation if not contraindicated. Air up position, NIV, HFNC are other useful alternative to prevent or reduce atelectasis.